On this episode of the Star Trek Universe podcast, we are discussing Lower Decks 207, Where Pleasant Fountains Lie, right after these words from our mystery sponsors. Star Trek Universe Podcast, the podcast where you get to listen in on the continuing Star Trek conversation the two lifelong friends have been having since they were six years old. My name is Matthew Carroll. I am David C. Robertson. How you doing, buddy? Ah, I'm doing okay. Back's a little better this week. Good, but, uh, good. Yeah, my, but my asshole's kind of hurting now. Oh, gosh. You know what they say, though. Uh, when God closes a window, he opens the door. <laughs> How you doing, man? Uh, worse now. <laughs> uh, you can you can handle a little flare up, you know. Uh, I I often do, um, but uh, no, yeah, I'm doing doing all right. Actually, I had a I I feel when I do these days I, today. I, I played at a wedding today, uh-huh. and when I play at weddings like this, it feels like I am legitimately like tearing my body up for money like i just feel (laughs) at the end of the day i literally i just feel i'm hurting like my whole body hurts my knees hurt my back hurts my legs hurt like i just feel really burnt up but i make Mm -hmm. more money in that day than i make the rest of the month like it's just a really it's a really good gig so i do it and today our uh, sound guy bailed. And so I ended up with like double duty. Basically I had to be our sound guy and the lead singer or whatever. So like I had to like, I just had to do a lot of work and didn't get a break from like basically 10 AM till midnight. So yeah, whew, I am, I am very exhausted, but uh, you know, uh, I feel, I feel good though that to have it, I feel good that it's over with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very happy to be done with it. I've been stressed about it. It's, we haven't had a weddings in the last couple of months for whatever reason. And, uh, mm-hmm. the heat in the summer keeps people from doing weddings. Really? <laughs> so it's yeah. finally cool enough to do weddings again. And like, yeah, it, it it's, uh, it, I, I, I get nervous when I haven't done them in a while. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I, I get nervous every time I do a podcast. Yeah, I get that. Like I get sick to my stomach before every recording. Really? Like, I've never done this before. I've done like probably, you know, 800, 900. Well, I mean, I've done, you know, close eh, about 650 episodes of DC on screen. Yeah. Over a hundred, almost 120 of this show. I've done several guest appearances. I get nervous, sick as a, as sick as a dog before every one. Really? Interesting. That's really interesting. I, I do not. Uh, I get nervous. So here's the thing I've learned about nerves for me. And it, this is obviously not the case with you. For me, nerves are whenever I haven't done something in a while or like mm-hmm. if it's not a normal part of my day, like if I'm not used to doing a certain thing, I get, I get nervous. It, like, so if I haven't done a wedding in two or three months, it feels abnormal. It feels like I'm not, I haven't done it in a while. It just like, I get super nervous. Um, and so the same thing with podcasting. Like if I, though, the, if there's a podcast, like a specific podcast I've never done, or if like I'm guesting on one I haven't done in a year or two, like, mm-hmm. uh, we, we recently did a guest spot on a Captain Game Show. Yeah. No. Oh, love. Yeah, love. That's, that's a good. Yeah. Love Captain show. Game Show. Always get really nervous yeah. before that one. I'm friends with John. I like John. Yeah, I like John a lot. We, we covered Lovecraft Country together, actually. Oh, um, good. and, uh, and he, he came on Pandavision to do all of Lovecraft Country with me. And, That's uh. That's awesome. Yeah, he, he's, uh, yeah, I like him a lot. He's a really cool guy. <laughs> I, I appreciate his affinity for haikus. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I, I appreciate his, like, work ethic to make that show like the amount of you know me and you like to get on the mic and bullshit about whatever tv show we watch today but like uh john (laughs) puts like puts the work in to make that podcast like he's he's like writing word games every week like that's hard work and it kills me because i don't feel like his show gets nearly the amount of recognition it deserves i totally agree I've, I've told him that i'm like dude i just i feel like it's a great show puts a lot of work in and it's like really great so if you guys don't listen to that check out captain game show it's really fun actually do you yeah. want to be on on a tuesday um tuesday hmm i'll get back to you i'm not really sure what the hell's going on tuesday. okay yeah but, uh, um, john john got me to get three pandas together to do it and then uh-huh. uh 
one of the pandas had a death in the family and had to oh. back out. I literally just got that text. So I, that's I was, unfortunate. You know, they're an endangered species. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. That chlamydia, man. Um. <laughs> oh, no, that's that's koalas. Sorry. Koalas have <laughs> chlamydia. <laughs> you had to go with. Uh, no, I would have made the same joke. <laughs> I, I didn't know it was koalas. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will say I, I I've been on Captain Game Show and it's, it's a great time. It's a lot of fun. Oh yeah, it's so much fun. I get really nervous though, I, just because it's just such yeah. a different environment for me. Yeah, and plus there's like not another show I don't feel like that could so adequately you know broadcast my idiocy. Oh, same. I there's always a game <laughs> where like I know I should know the answer. Like it, it'll be a stupid thing like name a fruit, and I'm like I don't know any fruits. Like my right. mind cannot come up with a f- fruit. <laughs> like Dave, you're holding a banana right now. How are you not getting this? Uh, yep, exactly. <laughs> you got a bowl of grapes in front of you and I'm like chestnuts no <laughs> uh, anyway yeah anyway so Star Trek Lower Decks what episode was this uh, 207, 207 where pleasant fountains lie that's an interesting title uh, uh, to think about this this episode and that the episode is about when a uh, Boimler and uh, Mariner get trapped on a planet with an evil computer. <laughs> uh-huh. Voiced by Jeffrey Combs, by the way. Oh, I did not catch that. Uh, I actually was listening yeah. to him and being like, this has got to be somebody. And I'm not placing it, though. I love Jeffrey Combs as the Agamus computer. I'll take Jeffrey Combs anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. When he's on DS9, I'll take him on Enterprise in the back of a Volkswagen. I, I just love Jeffrey Combs. So yeah, same, same. I think he's awesome, and that he, he's great as Agamus here. Um, I really, I it, this episode had two very entertaining plot lines. The, uh-huh. uh, the the evil computer was great, and very Star Trek. Like it, 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 all the references felt really good, and all the like, just sort of the concept of the evil computer trying to convince you to trying to convince people to be at war for a hundred years. Like, uh, yeah. Just, mm-hmm. It's, it, it oh, was I mean, really good. The, of course, the malevolent computer bent on causing destruction is a Star Trek staple. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, so this like got to play with that in like a funny way, and I, I enjoyed that. I loved it yeah. when they when they go to the planet and they're like, "He caught an AI convinced us to be at war with each other for a hundred years. It's so embarrassing." <laughs> <laughs> And they're like, well, at least it wasn't supernatural. <laughs> and, and, like, yeah. and, then, and then he like looks over and there's like a stained glass thing of them worshiping the computer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so silly. Have you seen have you seen Star Trek fans wearing the shirt that says, I am also played by Jeffrey Combs? Uh no, I haven't. That's funny. Yeah, it's been kind of going around Trek Twitter. It's good. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, and that's great. That was great. And then the Billups storyline, like, I feel like this is the first Billups focused episode we've gotten, right? Yeah, well, yeah, but you know, there was that line from uh, Second Contact where he said, uh, talking to a woman is his final frontier or something like that. It was, <laughs> I've got it written down here. Uh, they're talking about how he doesn't know how to talk to women. Knowing how to talk to women is kind of that guy's final frontier. So that kind of, Nice. Yeah. We got, we have a reason. But kind of, but like that's kind such of. a, that's such a big leap from there to what they end up with. And it's like such a silly concept. Uh, a world where, <laughs> first off, I love, I absolutely love the description of this planet. Oh, yeah. is that that planet where there were dragons? So all those Renfair types colonized it? <laughs> <laughs> yep. And it sounds really dumb, but as we exist in this time of geekery, I think it is now totally plausible. Oh, like, 100 makes, percent. Uh, so much sense. Yeah, like, no, it totally like, makes sense. <laughs> that is ex- exactly what, that's why Earth is a paradise, because all the Renfair nuts went to this other planet. <laughs> yeah. It feels a little, uh, and, 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 and then in a good way, it feels a little yeah. like Orville to me. Like, mm. like the fact that there are still Renfair types and like, I don't know, geeks in the future. Like that felt realer to me than most of, most of the things in Star Trek. <laughs> I think about, it seems like about half of the crew on TNG were, were Renfair nuts because they were always in the holodeck, you know, with all. <laughs> 
Yeah, the, that's true. That kind of shit. You're just like, Barkley's totally a Ren Fair nut. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, I don't know, if, but that's like the common form of entertainment. Like everybody, yeah. everybody's going in for these simulations, you know, I don't know. Yeah, screw you. We're going to go to a planet with actual dragons. Yeah, it's great. But yeah, no, I, I, en- I enjoyed it. I, I felt like this episode felt very Star Trek. Yeah, agreed. And I felt like there were a lot less gut laughs. I didn't actually have really any gut laughs uh upon viewing it in retrospect it's funnier i had a but few like, i had a few like i don't know <laughs> i really like uh i really like no billups loves his virginity <laughs> there's a couple really good just like yell yeah. out lines but i felt like this one was like more of like a, a quiet amusement like it was funny it was just you know you know like on tng when something like sexually racy or embarrassing would happen and picard would look uncomfortable and then look at Riker and Riker would just quietly smirk. That's how I felt this entire episode. Hmm. Yeah. Where it was just like, hmm, okay. <laughs> I don't know. There were a few lines that got me like, uh, ha ha, <laughs> you're too late. My Royal guards are trained from birth to skip foreplay. <laughs> yeah, and I just thought, like, from birth. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, 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 <laughs> you don't want to dust off that that statement too much, right? No, it's like, like it gave, I don't know, like different situations, but it gave me some real like Monsieur de la Souche vibes. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know what that is. Oh, um, do you know, uh, Mo- uh, Mo- how do you say his name? Mortier, uh, he wrote the school for wives. He was a French playwright. I don't. It's a good play. Um, it's about this guy who, um, who basically he wants like a, uh, a perfect wife or whatever. So he adopts like a little girl, like a four, four uh. year old, and he like gives her to a nunnery and they raise her until she's 17. And then he like puts her up in one of his houses and there's a little bit of a, it's, it's a farce, you know. He calls himself Monsieur de la Souche, but like he's got like another name that he uses, and he like not no one knows who Monsieur de la Souche is necessarily. But uh, you know, she he's got her locked up in this room because he doesn't want her to have sex or cheat on him or nothing. So, uh, but she starts talking to this this guy. Uh, she meets this boy outside of her window. And like, just, he just is, it's, it's a screwball comedy where he just keeps screwing up and like not being able to like get her to marry him, but also tr- he's trying to keep her from this guy. Anyway, that is, it's funny and awful and gross. And he's, you know, a terrible, horrible person. But that's just what it made me think of is like, gave me those kind of vibes like, ugh, from birth. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I agree. I like laughed really hard and then considered it. And I was like, that's not a. I, I'm not going to I'm not going to dig into what that would actually mean. You're right. Yeah. No, you don't want to do that. <laughs> I mean, you know, that you you can imagine a non problematic way of that being the case. But like like that's not, uh, you know, like like they just train them to not uh, have any uh like, like, uh, what was the thing where you, you delayed gratification and stuff like that? Like, no, you just always go right for the cookie. Don't, don't wait. <laughs> you know, like right. that. And then eventually it turns sexual. <laughs> well, you know, I hate, I hate to be the one to bring this up, but I'm going to, because, <laughs> oh, no. you know, it is a very Star Trek concept, uh, as envisioned by Gene Ronberry. <laughs> <laughs> Because, like, when you go to, like, read shit that he's written, like, just such as that, that, uh, that prologue that, like, you know, uh, notes from Captain Kirk or whatever, and, uh, the Star Trek The Motion Picture novel, uh, this is also, by the way, the one where he says that he, he prefers women and that he would never be with Spock because, uh, right. Because he, uh, would never be with someone who only made it for seven years. He talks about <laughs> how his, uh, his his name is James because he was named after his mother's first love instructor. Like there are all these like little weird like mentions throughout Roddenberry's right. Roddenberry's canon about like you know being a kid and kind of growing up in this like sexually free environment and stuff. Like right. there's a lot of weird stuff with Roddenberry. Anyway, <laughs> so it is kind of Star Trek. 
is what I'm saying. Yeah, sure, sure. Oh, man. Okay, so Troubling. I liked the line, <laughs> you can run your full diagnostic all over my bottom up. <laughs> yep. It's real good. Yeah, real good. I laughed at that one because uh, I like dirty things. <laughs> it was that, but I like completely absurd things that sound dirty like that. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, it's real good, uh, real funny. It's, al- it's almost as uh, as good as things that just sound dirty but don't make any damn sense. Like that's my favorite. But <laughs> yeah, I feel like but yeah. that. I feel like that's what that was. <laughs> but. Uh, no, I mean, she says you can run your full diagnostic along my bottom up. You know that. Yeah. 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 I, I know mean, what that means. You can infer if you want to, but it, well, you know what that the means. actual statement doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think my favorite line, <laughs> I think my favorite line was uh we need to get outside your comfort zone, but I love my zone. It's so comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I really liked after after she thinks he's dead, he's like she's like I should have never pushed him out of his comfort zone. He'd still be alive and, and comfortable. comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and then the the, yeah. the wrap up of that storyline where she's scared and says, "I guess sometimes it's just you're just gonna seem like you died." <laughs> and that's what Starfleet is. And he says, "That's Starfleet." Yeah, <laughs> oh chipper. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I you know I look forward to seeing Billups' mom again because it actually it seemed like she was. They were hinting that she'll be back. Obviously, yeah. Uh, she had a real Waxana oh, for Troy sure. vibe to her. For sure. And I think most shows could benefit from the occasional meddlesome broad. <laughs> All right. You know, a real busybody. I know I know Norm passed away this 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 past week. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to fully inhabit. You don't have to make no. up for the lack of Norm on the earth. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> the world could really use a meddlesome broad. Like it's very, it was very Norm <laughs> Macdonald. Um, no, I, I, I liked, uh, yeah, I, I liked, I liked her. And it's just a funny, I mean, it's funny because of its inversion of the trope of like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, 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 the mother who comes in is like, how can I trick my son into having sex? <laughs> and yeah. just the concept, the entire concept is funny. I liked when, uh, Rutherford <laughs> ran into his room and said, Oh no, Billups, did your kingdom come? Oh, I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. Uh, but yeah, no, I don't want people to get the wrong idea. I, you know, a busy body on a show can be anybody, you know, Don Knotts on, on the Andy Griffith show was, he was one of the busiest bodies. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he was fantastic at it. I just wanted to say meddlesome broad cause I thought it pissed people off and that's my favorite thing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I, I, know I, actually, I, I actually, I said it cause I thought you would laugh. <laughs> that's the only reason I said it. I know, I know, I know. I know you don't really, uh, <laughs> you, you, you like to say things that would piss people off. You don't actually like to piss people off. <laughs> no, I feel bad when people actually get upset. I'm like, Oh, yeah. don't, don't do that. And then I would go along my day because I don't actually care. <laughs> like we were just playing, it's fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I I liked her. I liked the whole concept of that race and uh, just yeah, the whole Renfair people taking over a planet because because it has dragons just rings so true, and I absolutely love it. I loved that they like called all of their shit after like the dragon's breath drive or whatever. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. He's like, don't, don't do that. Rutherford tries to just like freestyle that. He's like, well, what about the elf manifold? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, don't do that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I I liked Billups though. You know, um, who's that guy? Who's the guy? Paul that, Shearer, um, right? Paul Shear, that's right. And um, he, he, the guy from the league. And his wife played his mother on here. Oh, funny. That's June funny. Raphael, whatever her name is. What, yeah, June Raphael. Ah, what is her it's, name? It's something June Raphael, I think. Yeah. I, mean, I don't remember. Uh, June Diane Raphael, yeah. There we go. Now, there we go. She also does a podcast with him. That's right. Are they married, right? They're married. In okay, real life, yeah. I remembered that. IRL, as the kids said. <laughs> I listened to their bad movie podcast, whatever that's called. That they do with Jason Matsukas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but, uh, how did this get made? Is that that's right? That's it. That's it. Really good show. Um, a really good concept in general, like finding show, finding movies and be like, how in the hell did this get like, how did this just ever exist? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny when you like, I don't know when you go, uh, when you watch these, these movies that like have glaring problems and you're j- especially for me, it's the writing. Like when you, when writing has just like clear obvious problems that like it don't, they don't logically line up and make sense. Like Mm -hmm. I'm always just like, how did that make it onto the screen? How did it go through all of the people that the script had to go through and still make it onto the screen without fixing that problem? (laughs) Uh, too many cooks usually. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't know. I was reading that article today. Uh, James Marsters came out talking about, uh, uh, it, it wasn't much new information, but about how, uh, about the Joss Whedon situation and his, uh, you know, mistreatment of people on his sets or whatever. Um, this is, uh, Spike. Yeah. 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 Okay. I was but, thinking of the guy that played, um, that was in Superman, the guy Cyclops. <laughs> yeah. That's James Marsden, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can't keep up. And then there's the little guy who was on step by step and that, I think his name is Jason. Yeah. That's James, James Marsden's Marsden. brother. He My all, God. I met him uh last month. <laughs> That's weird. Yeah, it is weird. Uh but he played uh <laughs> Max on a goofy movie. Yeah. yeah. And uh I, went, I I've told the story on I think the MCU cast, but uh I went to a con and he was one of the one of the guests like would like sign an autographs cuz he was he's <laughs> been like, like a con. <laughs> <laughs> he's been like a hundred different animated people. So he's like signing, yeah. signing autographs, uh, as, as Jason Marsden. Um, right. any, anyway, he's, he, he like, uh, came, he was walking by and I was in a room watching a bunch of preteen girls do, uh, lip sync contests, a lip sync contest. That doesn't sound good out of context. No, it, it, believe me, it didn't look good out of context. Uh, no, it does. Have no, it was my, my niece. <laughs> I was with my niece and she wanted to do the no. lip sync contest. So I well, said, no, if, yeah, if you're with a little girl, it's okay. That makes, it makes Here's a lot the more problem. Sense. About halfway through the con, the lip sync contest, she decided to go to the bathroom and Kelly, uh, Kelly Mancacci was with us. Kelly yeah. decided to take her. Uh, to the bathroom. And then I uh-huh. didn't, I didn't think anything of it. I was like, all right, cool. Uh, I'll see you on a minute. And then they got uh-huh. up to leave. And then I looked around the room and realized I was in a room with all preteen girls. A yeah. lot of, the, a lot of them in tiny, like anime outfits and skirts and stuff and like uh-huh. doing, doing weird, uh, anime dances. And I was the only male and I was by myself in this room. <laughs> I was like, uh, this, this doesn't look great. <laughs> no. It's no, it's no fault of my own. It's nothing actually amiss, but it definitely didn't look great. <laughs> yeah. Like the guy who accidentally took a smoke break outside of the, you know, the playground, you know, the, the elementary school playground. <laughs> and then he looks over and there's a cop <laughs> staring at him like, uh huh. <laughs> like, no, no, you don't understand. It's different. You see? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't look. I, 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 that was my real sin. I didn't look. I didn't know it was there. <laughs> well, uh, so so anyway, they're doing this lip sync contest, and one of the girls decides to do uh, one of the songs from a Goofy movie. Uh, uh-huh. the, the, the final song, the one that, uh, the one that they do at the end of the movie. If we listen to each other's heart. That song. Um, okay. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> did, do you, have I you seen, remember the song? Do you, do you know, do you know the movie well? I don't know if you remember the movie well. Not well. Well, I, I saw the, it like the, once when I was an appropriate age for it. The I, big <laughs> resolution to the movie is that like, uh, Goofy's been t- trying to teach his son the perfect cast. Okay. You know, it's like his perfect yeah. cast that he does. It's like this very overly complicated cast before he's fishing. And, yeah, I uh, remember that vaguely. They end up on stage with Powerline and, uh-huh. uh, and, and he's like, Dad, do the perfect cast, you know? And so d- he, Goofy does it and then Powerline mimics him and they all learn the perfect cast and it's the new dance craze. That's how the uh-huh. movie resolves. Anyway, so this girl's doing that song. And, uh, Jason Marsden comes running in the room from the other room and he does the perfect cast. And like, I don't, 
I, I, it's weird how much it affected me. <laughs> it's weird how gleeful, <laughs> how gleeful I was seeing the guy who played Max. Cause I grew, that's one of my favorite movies when I was a kid. Like I loved that movie. Yeah. And uh, I watched it like 50 times at least. That's a lot. I watched it like, uh, the, like half of it one time. I don't, I think I saw it when I was a kid. I'm pretty sure I did. On TV. It's one of those that, like, I feel like a lot of, like, missed a lot of people, but, like, I absolutely love it. And, uh, anyway, so Jason Marsden is standing in front of me doing the perfect cast, and it was, like, weirdly, like, super, super, like, joyful moment. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, yeah. it's the guy, and he's doing the thing. <laughs> and so I took a video of it and everything. Actually, I sent it to Bethany. Okay. Um, uh, mm-hmm. And so uh, I walk over... Uh, to, I walk over to him afterwards and I'm like, dude, that was so much fun. I've been to cons. I've been to panels and stuff. That was the most fun I've ever had. Cause it was so unexpected and I just didn't, it's great, man. It's super cool of you that you jumped in there and did that. And he was like, he was like, Oh, thanks, man. I just learned it. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, I learned it from TikTok." <laughs> oh God. Which I thought, he's like, that's the first time I've ever done it in front of people. (laughs) And I just thought it was like the weirdest, like, another weird serendipity thing that I was like, I got to see him do the perfect cast for the first time. I don't know. It was weird. And I liked it. It was was really fun. (laughs) Yeah. Now, you know, I didn't, I I didn't see it in theater, but um, I did watch, I think, either uh, rental or, or on TV or something. And what I liked about it was... I used to watch Goof Troop, and I liked the idea that they were aging up the characters, that they were continuing the continuity, right? But now, like they were, you know, teenagers. I I, I like that kind of stuff. What was the J the 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 James Marston thing? What was what was that? What was Spike saying about Joss? Oh, he was just talking about. Uh how uh apparently and this 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 story is old apparently i he appara- apparently joss like uh th- like pinned him against a wall one time and said like mm-hmm. no you're not supposed to be some fucking romantic vampire they're not supposed to like you like like that you're supposed to be an evil vampire like um <laughs> and he was like apparently joss was just like um no, I was like, no, no. Remember, he was livid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joss was very angry, and he was mm-hmm. like, he was like, no, they're not supposed to, they're not supposed to like you. Which I always, I always heard that story that uh, J- yeah. that Spike was only supposed to be on a short number of episodes, yep. and then die, and then he, they keep bringing him back because the audience loved him so much and he's like everyone's favorite character and um the, and actually I found it very interesting reading this article cuz apparently Josh the reason the reason Josh was so upset according to this article was that like he truly believed that like we, they shouldn't re- revel in the vampires on that show because there are supposed to be like a pure representation of evil <laughs> and so uh-huh. like <laughs> which I kind of love that like I mean, a spoiler alert for Buffy, but like, I love that storyline and it actually made me really think about, you know, you were just mentioning, um, about too many cooks, right? And that, mm-hmm. that's, I think that's what sent me on this very weird rabbit hole where I've gotten to goofy movie and back. But, um, yeah. uh, I was thinking about that too many cooks idea because like Joss Whedon, I, I love Joss Whedon's stuff. I, I've loved it for a long time, but like, Spike is one of my favorite characters and and a lot of that is because of the redemption arc he gives him and it's it's it, it, like redemption but he's still him and it's like really really well done and I think of that as like I think of that fact that like he didn't want Spike to stick around and uh-huh. like that's probably the network telling him like no, no, you have to keep this guy. The fans, he's, he's really, you know, he's really rating well with the preteens or whatever. You got to keep him. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you, you think about that too many cooks thing. And sometimes, yes, that can be horrible. But sometimes, like, you know, these guys who think they're absolute geniuses, like, and we all thought, you know, think they're geniuses at times. Sometimes they need those guys that are, like, forcing them to do something they don't mm-hmm. want to do. Because then they come up with, like, a clever way to do it, you know? Oh, absolutely. Like, uh, you know, I've got this book here. It's called, uh, Batman Animated. And, uh, in, in this thing, they detail all the ways that Fox kids, uh, and subsequently Warner Brothers 
uh, for Kids WB, uh, put restraints on Paul Dini and Alan Burnett and Bruce Tim. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so they had to find creative ways of, of, of showing things and doing things on Batman, the animated series. And, uh, and now they just have free reign and they can just do whatever the hell they want. So they make these like movies that are just like kind of weirdly over sexualized and just don't have <laughs> nearly the same impact that the old show did. And I'm like, <laughs> I never thought I'd say this, but I need a Fox Kids censor in here. <laughs> I don't need to see Harley's nipples. Someone, <laughs> someone call an adult. Someone get a Fox censor in here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, that's interesting. I, I, I really do think that often those. I mean, it's it's not a new concept, but I think those um, restraints lead to creativity. Like that's what creativity is in a way. It's yeah. like finding a way around a problem. You know, you want to say something, but then you've got this restraint, and how can you make that happen? And I, I love mm-hmm. that. I, I actually think, like, you know, I just finished the Star Trek albums. Uh, if you haven't heard them yet, check it out on Spotify. They're called Earl Grey Hot and Save Each Other. Um, but, uh, it's, uh, I just finished those albums and like something I've learned is like, if I have this restraint of like, I am going to write a song and it has to be about this episode. Uh huh. Then I can finish a song. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. like, I, I'll go a year or two sometimes without writing a song, but. That, that 20 weeks in a row where we did all those episodes on the podcast and I wrote songs, like yeah. I wrote 20 songs in 20 weeks, you know, it was just like every week was a new thing. And I even wrote a couple bonus songs in there about other stuff while I was doing all that. Um, and it's just like when I have that restraint of like, it's got to be about this. Yeah. It's just easier to be creative when you have a, I mean, you, obviously you have a goal in mind, you have some like sort of start a place to start from, but you also just have, but the the worst thing is just I mean everybody everybody talks about hating the blank page you know and yeah. um if you just sort of give yourself these sorts of projects I I listen to that a podcast from the guy who does Sleeping at Last you know what I'm talking about no I don't think so there's a band called Sleeping at Last and I forget the guy's name um but it is like the band <laughs> is one guy it's like one of those. Uh-huh. Uh, it's one of those stupid bands like that where it's one guy, but he calls himself a band and it's just sleeping at last. Uh, yeah. by the way, check out the garage on Spotify. <laughs> hey, it's one of those bands. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, that's no. the joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, sleeping at last is like, uh, this band and he just like does a lot of those sorts of albums. Like he'll do, uh, I'm going to do a song about each of the planets, you know, and he like writes uh-huh. a song about each of the planets in the, in our solar system. And then he writes a song about, uh, he recently did a whole thing on the Enneagram. You know what Enneagrams uh-huh. are? They're like personality types. Yeah, so yeah. he wrote, there's nine personality types according to the Enneagram thing. So like uh-huh. he wrote a song for each of the personality types. Uh, it's yeah. just, you know, it's just like that, that kind of stuff I really get into. Yeah, I really like that, uh, with, uh, Sufjan Stevens, how he did every album was a state. Yeah. Now I don't care for his music. Yeah, except he only did two, I think. Yeah. <laughs> did you, I, think I don't I, care for it, but I like the idea. Actually, uh, Spencer, our, our good buddy, uh, just told me yeah. about Sufjan Stevens just put out an album, uh, that it's all about movies. He wrote, uh-huh. I guess, a whole album and he just, he, each track is based on a different movie. Yeah. And, uh, that's really cool. Um, and apparently, I think it's a few that we like, a few movies we like too. Interesting. Um, so I've been meaning to check that out. Yeah. You know, I, I draw and I, I write and I, I try to do some creative things. And I find, you know, a lot of artists say like, oh, you can just go wild, be as creative as you want. I find I'm much better if I have some sort of horrible, stringent rule set. <laughs> because. <laughs> Like, I actually finish drawings when I'm like, I can only use this brush and procreate. Like, what What are you going to do with it, Dave? Right, <laughs> like, yeah. Like, you can change the size or the opacity. You can do, you can, you know, turn the pencil on its side and do it. You can, you know, use, you can alter the brush, but you can only use that brush. Like, I set up weird things like that for myself just so I'll finish something. Yeah. 
Because with too many options, I can't. I yeah. can't get anything done. That's the thing, man. It's the blank page. It's the, the the idea that there's just like you can do anything you want, and then you just don't do anything. That's just how yeah. it is. I think the most I've written, uh, probably in the last mm, ten years or so, is I just went to Google Maps and like chose a random place, and they picked some <laughs> random. Place. Random place in Louisiana. I just like researched it deeply. I was like, the whole story has to take place in this town. Hmm. (laughs) I got bored, of course, but it was the most I'd written in years. (laughs) Yeah, man. Uh, uh, We've clearly left behind Star Trek long ago in this conversation, but, um, you know, it's the creativity is creativity is just. There's so many different elements of keeping it going. Like, yes, inspiration and finding it and finding your Mm -hmm. finding. It's like because I write that way, the same way that I just talked about Sufjan Stevens writing and because I write that way. Well, where I like I have I have this particular thing I'm going to make and I make that thing. Um, Uh I sometimes don't think of myself as a creative person uh, because Mm -hmm. because I'm not just like. My stuff doesn't come from nowhere. Like it, I, yeah. I, I kind of need like a a guiding thing. That's it's so so. It's, it feels more like putting a puzzle together to me. Yeah. Than it does um, just like creating like blank canvas, throwing paint at it. You know, it's like it's more like um, I have a goal in mind, and there's just puzzle pieces, and I have the language and the, the way that I know that chorus structure works and stuff. You know, mm-hmm. um, and so. Uh, it, but th- that's just one part of it though. Like you also have to have that like stick to itiveness or whatever, like that, the grit yeah. to be like, all right, I'm going to actually finish this thing. I'm going to get through this album. <laughs> and, I think, I think, I think there's a lot of, uh, emphasis put on creatives, uh, uh creating things out of whole cloth. Mm-hmm. And I'm a big believer in there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, just <laughs> everyone's got muses and references, and like anyone who does, who actually does anything, who actually accomplishes anything. Uh, if you're very good and you're very up on your uh, uh, uh pop culture, uh, you can see their their uh their inspirations and, and what they took from. Uh, but most people in in most of the general audience is going to go, Oh, they're brilliant. Look at that. Look at what they created. No, they didn't create it. They, they cobbled things together and made something they would enjoy or would try to enjoy. I think that's the best we can really do. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but I, I do have a couple more bits for the Star Trek episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Throw wanna, them out. If you want to go. Throw them out. I, I got through mine, that. so I just when we started going down <laughs> rabbit holes. I wasn't being restrictive. Yeah, no, I, I you know. Um, <laughs> I love the, the, the bit where she referred to, uh, Agamus as the, uh, a hundred year old router. <laughs> yeah, that was really funny. <laughs> and I loved it because, the whole time Agamus was trying to get to a computer port, I kept thinking, I can barely keep my phone from trying to pair with every device in my damn house. Does Agamus not have Wi-Fi? Like, is he not just pairing with everything? I don't know. It was weird to me. Well, I, th- um, I think often those things like Bluetooth, for instance. Yeah, you gotta are, have a password. Yeah, you gotta have a password or you have to like, uh, go, you have to both, both things have to agree to connect and stuff. Yeah. But sometimes as you go in, uh, wired, you just have access, you know? Mm hmm. That's right. Even computers require consent, kids. That's right. Um, <laughs> Did you did you see that one of the one of the evil computers in the Daystrom Institute just had like the CBS logo on it? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and I want to know what that computer does. Does it just subdue people with mediocre CSI spinoffs <laughs> to create a docile population? <laughs> it's just like, oh, here's another Big Brother spinoff. Oh, yes, yay. it actually does do that <laughs> currently. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. As soon as I get off with you here, well, not get off with you because, you know, yeah. we've been friends a long time. I think it ruined the friendship. Yeah. But yeah. Gotta you know, protect when the friendship. We're, that's, when the, we're, that's the only reason. <laughs> I mean, (laughs) I mean, you got to protect the friendship. (laughs) 
<laughs> as soon as we're done here, I'm going to watch a couple episodes of Big Brother with my wife. So, like, man, it's been good this season. <laughs> good. Good. I'm glad. I yeah. hear I hear good things. Mostly just from you. <laughs> yeah, it's a shitty, you know, reality show. But it's better than a shitty reality show. You know what I mean? Like, it's, right. it's a little better than most of them, I find. And uh, it's entertaining. Is you know just counting down the hours to to death, mm. <laughs> and along the way, me and my wife can go. Oh, I can't believe they did that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you see Kylan sniffing those tortillas? Like well, he was rubbing his face all over him. What a freak! <laughs> Glad he's gone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's real silly. Anyway, that's that's all. That's all I've got, man. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I enjoyed this episode. It's good. Yeah, it felt like old Star Trek for whatever reason. Yeah, I get that. It did. It did. It felt a little more grounded than some of the episodes for sure. And another old staple, you know, the the crash shuttlecraft on a desert planet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, although they just mentioned it last week, but like I, I really thought they might be on like Khan's planet or something. Were there any other? Um, you mentioned the <laughs> the evil computer that looks like CBS. I feel like there's a lot of there was a lot of opportunities. Were there any other evil computers in there that like were from any episodes? Did you notice? I I didn't recognize any. Okay. Um, I have to admit, I was I was a little bit disappointed. Not really disappointed because I shouldn't expect it, but uh, I I'll just say it this way: I would love a follow up because they brought up Landrew last last year. Mm-hmm. from uh, Return of the Archons. And, uh, you know, he had that, like, big, like, uh, quaffed, queefy hairdo. And uh, he was an evil computer that was controlling a population. I would love to see a sequel to... to uh, I would love Landrew to return. And uh, I kind of felt like, yeah, I don't know, Agamus. Uh, I could have dealt with Landrew, though. Like, <laughs> can it be Landrew? Okay. Right, uh, but yeah, it does. You know, that's fun too. Like, it, I don't need lower decks to be just nothing but a reference farm. And uh, yeah, this one didn't feel like that necessarily. So uh, not okay too much. I, I, there were definitely lots of references. I do think it is kind of a reference farm, but like, I don't mind that. I guess it's a different. It's like a thematic reference farm, or or you know, a uh, well, situational reference farm. It wasn't like where you like they literally have. Just like constant references, both verbal and in the background. It was not as bad as other episodes. And I say bad because we're sort of talking about it in a way. I don't think it's bad when they do that. I think it's fine. But like, it wasn't like Spock 2's giant corpse falling on them. Right. But I mean, there were things like, we should bury it. Like they did Data's head. You know, there's, there's a lot of little things like that. Data was in a cave. <laughs> Yeah, there was that. But you know, I love I love that idea too in that they do in their show and I'm sure I've said it before. I like the idea that the shows that we've been watching, yeah, are there real years, world heroes? Are there real world heroes? Yeah. Um and there was even uh there you know, like I said I think I've said before in that Captain Kirk thing that Roddenberry wrote, like he was like basically he described the original series as like historical things for children or something mm -hmm. <laughs> that have been exaggerated over the years. Mm -hmm. Um, I like the, that the idea that they're, you know, like they're like the Sully Sullenberger movie. Like we, we, they just have like Star Trek movies in the Star Trek universe that, <laughs> that kind of, uh, yeah. Are like, totally. Hey, look at this. Uh, it, it's a fun idea at the very least. And, and with, like with the plate of, uh, Tom Paris Tom plate, Paris you know, they have plate. like the freaking <laughs> merch and stuff. Not only like do they have the stories, but it makes them all kind of fanboys of, I mean, yeah. Boimler is definitely a fanboy. And you know, you've you got the, you know, when I was a kid, they would come on, uh, I don't watch television anymore. So they might still have this kind of stuff, but they would be like, oh, if it's, uh, uh, seven payments, seven easy payments. Of 1995 to get the collector set of uh, the Revolutionary War 
Look at these plates. There's a George Washington cross in the Delaware. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> like, like, people are like shelling out Latinum in the Star Trek universe to see Tom Paris on a plate next <laughs> to Voyager. <laughs> I, <laughs> I like the concept. Uh, I, nothing about it. It's silly as shit. Yeah, it's but, real silly. Uh, I feel like it's, if you look at our real world, you go, oh, most of the shit y'all are doing is stupid, too. <laughs> I, think I got a plate with Bill Clinton's face on it. <laughs> Almost a dick. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that doesn't make sense. What? <laughs> yeah, man. He was a disgraced president. Why would you want his place on a plate? Yeah. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't want anybody's, I don't want any president's picture on a plate. <laughs> uh, this is my, this is my dick pic plate. It's just like yeah. Richard Nixon's face. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. You did it. <laughs> I did it. You pulled it off. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, I feel, I feel we've, we've, we, this, this one has run its course. <laughs> <laughs> I think it ran its course about 30 minutes ago, man. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. We, 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 we got through the con, we, we talked, we finished talking about Star Trek a while ago mostly. Uh, but yeah, this is a good episode. Good episode. Yeah, I, I'm they down. They tune in I like for it. Star Trek, man. They tune in for, uh, you know, this. Yeah. They tune in for our chemistry. <laughs> our, our camaraderie. <laughs> I the, don't think that's true. The um, 30 year old friendship. That's yeah, the, that's, that's what they've. That's the hook, man. That's the hook of the show now. Yeah. Uh, we're just, we're just, we're just curving into it. For a while it was like, no, let's, let's get, let's, let's get real serious about covering Star Trek. Yeah. And we are. We're going to cover Star Trek. It's hard to be serious about covering Star Trek when Star Trek that you're covering isn't serious. Well, and sometimes when there's 10 minutes, just t- 10 minutes to say about lower decks we're going to talk for 50 it's just going to happen sometimes <laughs> oh you know what we should have we should have brought up uh the fact that uh mariner is sabotaging boimler's career for her own like personal like selfish bullshit yeah yeah well is she though she has or maybe a point. he's not really ready, but right. he seemed like he was ready this episode. Yeah, yeah. No, she kind of, he kind of proved himself this episode to her yeah. uh, by by shooting her and like being willing to go go where he needed to go to get the things done. You know, I yeah. I think he uh, he definitely proved himself to her in a way that she didn't expect. So that's oh my god, and that, that that got a belly laugh. I forgot about that. Where, where Agamus says, I will blind you. And then like, he just yeah. flickers the lights, you know? He's like, oh, yeah, all you have control of is the dimmer. <laughs> that was really good. It was really good. <laughs> I will blind you. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, uh, they did some character development here. No, for sure. I, uh, we didn't really talk about it, I guess, but yeah, that's, yeah. that's definitely in there. I'm enjoying all the character development on the show. <laughs> Star Trek Universe podcast, wade through teams of shit to get to us <laughs> talking about the show. <laughs> As an afterthought. Listen, listen, we mostly <laughs> talked about genre fiction stuff, mostly. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. it's fine. I just forgot. And, and Tandy was very worried that Rutherford was dead. I feel like she's gonna, you know, I don't know. Get up some nerve to to uh, hop on the disco stick or something. <laughs> hop on, man. I don't, I don't know. Uh, you I, don't know. know. <laughs> I don't know what that I, means. I was trying uh, to class it up. <laughs> uh, well, it does seem that she realized uh, how much his death would mean to her, yeah. and and that's uh, that seems um, seems like it might lead to us. Uh, uh, to them having some uh, deeper relationship, and I'm guessing that could mean romance, romance yeah. in their future. I mean, there's a reason it's called deeper relationship. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, well, it's really late. <laughs> it's 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 my bedtime. It's I, <laughs> no man, I'm just teasing you. No, it's Fun. fine. I understand. Uh, well, guys, thanks for hanging out. Uh, we'll be, we'll be back, uh, back next week with more Lower Decks. It's got three more weeks of Lower Decks, and then we get to Discovery starts back. Oh, Prodigy. No, it's Prodigy. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it's Prodigy, and then Discovery is in November, so. 
how long is Prodigy going to be? Are they going to overlap? I don't know. I haven't paid attention to the dates. Seems like, I mean, if Prodigy starts in three weeks, then in November, November will only be like a week or two after that. So, yeah, I mean, this, they've lined it up with a pretty tight schedule because by the time Discovery ends, Picard will be out. Man, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. Yep. All right, guys. Well, uh, I, uh, I'm Matthew Carroll and it's been good talking to you guys. Uh, I'm going to redo that. That was weird. That was weird. I'm sleepy. I'm sleepy. I think you should keep it. All right. I'll keep it. Bye, guys. (laughs) So long, true. (laughs) Live long and prosper. Thank you for listening to the Star Trek Universe Podcast, a Stranded Panda production. If you'd like to hear more from David C. Robertson, check out the DC On Screen Podcast or maladjusted.tv for his web videos. If you'd like to hear more from Matthew Carroll, check out the Marvel Cinematic Universe Podcast or listen to his music. Just search for Matthew Carroll anywhere you get music. 